Good morning and welcome to uh, Educational or EPSI 3300. I'm Lee Sterling. I'm uh, in for Dr. Doug Lieberman today. And uh, actually, Dr. Lieberman's in the audience today, so he's going to be critiquing me too as well as we, when we go over the last part of these, um, these slides on the humanist. Specifically, we're going to get in today into Maslow. And uh, we're, we're picking back up on uh, slide six if you're following at home. And uh, what, we're what we're talking about, as according to the rest of the students here this morning, uh, are the personality problems or loud protests against the crushing of psychological bones. And I want to dwell on that just a little. I probably dwelled on it a little bit, but we'll, I want to quickly go over it again because it's very, very important to the humanist, especially to Maslow, which is, this is his direct quote. Um, it's very important for him to see this as, because he, he believes that people are basically good, okay? So what's important about it is, is that he believed that society in of itself is, is part of the problem, meaning that all of the things that we see as wrong or, or, or errors or problems with other people we create this system, this compacting, this squishing, crushing, crushing of psychological bones. And we actually, in effect, imprint or create these people to be the way they are. That they're naturally good. They're basically good. But in the process of going through our society, all our rights of initiation, our passages, our rights of passage, everything it is that to understand to be a, a member of the society we actually get crushed and um, it's a it's a fundamental it's a fundamental uh, construct that he's got now, dr. Lieberman is in the audience and he's more than welcome at any point in time to interject which I'm surely I'm sure he will so um, by the way you might notice that my appearance is somewhat different today uh, my fiance saw what I looked like whenever I was on TV, and she quickly remedied the way that I look, and um, so that's why you have the new and improved <laughs> Lee Sterling. So you can have I can thank my fiance about that. So um, glad to speaking see all of you. Speaking of this social morning. pressures, right? <laughs> yeah, speaking of social pressures, exactly. Uh, the next one, <coughs> next look, next little. Uh, piece of his philosophy. Self-actualizing people can live more freely in the realm of being. Okay, it's a little, a little out there. It's, uh, everything's going, and okay. So there's a little, uh, sorry. Well, sorry, it just doesn't work, no? We are now experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. It's working now. I forgot that it was even there. All right, self-actualizing people can live more freely in a realm of being. We briefly touched on self-actualizing or, or self-actualization, okay? But if you can get to that level, everything around you and everything about you. Can you put the picture back on him? Thank you. <laughs> everything about you and everything around you, okay, becomes in effect easier because you have set it up. You have allowed yourself and you've overcome all of these obstacles that are going up. You've satisfied, and we're going to, uh, I've been holding off on this because we haven't gotten to the, I guess we can go forward. Okay. These, this is the, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is the one, this is like the key component. It, you, you'll see it in all walks of life. You'll see it in sociology, psychology. You'll see it in business. You'll see it in it's very, very important construct that's utilized all over in all over the different fields, okay? And it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, okay? And we talked about this briefest, I'm gonna go through all the way so you can see them all the way up, okay? Remember we were talking about a child. You ba Maslow states that if a child is at the base level and those psychological needs are not met, I mean, a physiological, meaning that if there is a, if a child cannot have enough food to eat, the reason for them going to school is not to learn 
but instead to, to get food. The primary motivation is to the uh, obtaining of food. If I'm starving, what's going to be my goal? Is it, am I going to be worrying about my safety? No. I, am I going to am I going to steal things? Think about it. Would you, if you were st that's a hard it's a hard question to ask if you've never been hungry. Okay. If you've never had a day of hungry, or never a day of hungry, <laughs> a day of hungry. If you've never had a day of hunger, it's very hard to understand that deep, deep deep-seated feeling of not being able to acquire food, okay? There's also some other, um, uh, with physiological things, uh, and, and it, what's interesting about it is you can also tie that to some drugs. Um, it's very easy to see how people in their system, if they're addicted to drugs and alcohol and things like that, how they need it, okay? It becomes it's not safety or esteem or anything like that. It may start off, someone may begin to drink because of esteem needs, but then it becomes, and they drop down all the way to, phys you know, to a physiological need. And that makes it so, that's why people will hide it so much. It's an, important to understand, Maslow has a, if you take that, that first construct, if you do not meet this physi physiological need, if you do not meet, if you meet it at all, you're not going to advance. You're not going to move up this level, this hierarchy. Okay? It's extremely important about that. Okay? The next, all right, think about it. Lee, yeah. Maybe click on the arrow um, first so you can talk about. That go back? No, the arrow right by, sta uh, uh, up by Maslow's hierarchy. You see it, the forward arrow? That one? Go there? Yeah, you can't see it on the camera. Yeah. Oh, it's right underneath needs. Take his picture out for a second. No, yeah, there you go, hierarchy and sequence. That's if you can talk about that and the potency of needs, this will make more sense. Okay. All right, go all the way to the end. Yeah, okay. Go, go, back, no, go back to the hierarchy first. And sequence? Oh. What is hierarchy? Okay, That's you right. remember we talked about this already. Maslow's needs stages are hierarchical. Okay? You have to get one need fulfilled before you can go to the next one, unlike Freud. Right, it's like Piaget, you gotta get one stage right before you go to the next one. For Freud and Erickson, it's not that way. It's just messed up. So if your physiological needs are never met, that's where you're gonna stay. Okay, hit the button again. Forward or back? No, forward. Okay, you want me to talk about that? You wanna talk about that? Yeah, you come on. Come okay. sit up here. So you can see, no, go, go back. Now the needs are innate, but they're not of equal strength. Right, you see that? The needs are innate, you're born with them. Every human being has these needs, but they're in a hierarchy of potency, strength, if you will, okay? And you're motivated by your, your most, your strongest, your most potent, unsatisfied need. To the, to, to, to the uh, limit of all others, it right. becomes, it doesn't, it's not relative, okay? It is not a relative thing. It becomes, it moves to the forefront. Exactly. It's it. So if, you, so as Lee was saying, if you're starving, if I'm not, and he's not talking about, oh, you got up late and you missed breakfast. No. And then, oh, you had a lunch meeting that was canceled, so there's no lunch, and you had a late class. So you get home 7.30 and you haven't eaten anything. I'm starving. Not that kind of starving. He's talking about starving. There's no food. Okay, and there are people in the world, unfortunately, in that kind of situation. So you're motivated, motivated by that. If that needs met, the next one pops out. If that one's met, the next one's pops out. So you're motivated by your, your least, your your strongest need that has not been satisfied. But okay? in in hierarchical order. It's, it's hierarchical, right. So if the need is, remember a hierarchy means, unlike a sequence, you've got to get one thing right before you go to the next one. So you've got, now Maz was a little wishy-washy about this. He says, well, if 90% of your me needs are met at one level, you can go on to the next one. And there may be a residue, but basically it's hierarchical. And of course what he's telling you, what Lee was telling you, if you have a kid who is literally starving at home, or has very poor diet and is really physiologically a mess, okay? 
you're not going to be able to start motivating that kid by plans for the future and what's the nature of your life when you're going to be 82, right, or 42, right? If you have a kid who's sleep deprived because there's constant turmoil in the, in the, in the house, you're, you can't get mad at the kid for sleeping in school. It's one place where it's quiet. Your voice is droning in the front and the kid can go to sleep, right? Sleep deprivation is a physiological need, okay? Those kinds of things. So you need to be very aware of that and that it is a hierarchy. Okay, hit, hit the button one more time and then hit the arrow back. No, no, the other way. Keep going. Keep hitting. Okay, the need. Okay, and as Lee was saying, the needs are universal. The same needs are everywhere, but culture, as he pointed out, what's going on in your society often determines how the needs are satisfied and whether they're satisfied. So what okay. brings esteem in one culture may not bring esteem in another culture. Go ahead, Lee was saying. Yeah, and it, it's, and the, the needs themselves are there. They're universal throughout. But how they're met is, is actually culture. A lot of times, and people think of culture as a separate entity, but culture is, is a part of this. Determining when someone is going to eat and how they eat and determining when someone uh, can go get their own home to live with or uh, whenever they're, uh, you know, when it's okay for them to marry, getting permission from their parents. These are all things that satisfy your needs that are built into cultural structures. And we think of it as culture as a separate entity, but culture is a part of it. And that's, that's one of the key things that, that as far as, uh, as this is concerned, is because he, he is saying needs are, are universal, but he also, I mean, like, he, like Dr. Lieberman was saying, uh, whichever one has the most potency of strength, whichever one is the one that, it, that on the level that you, as far as you've reached, whichever one has the most potency of need, is the one that you're going to go about fixing or, or uh, allevi um, alleviating. Alleviating, that's right. Yeah, alleviating the need. So you're going to do whatever it is that it takes to, in that realm, to get it done. Now, let's go back well, let to me the. Say one, but one of the criticisms of Maslow's theory, of Freud's theory, was that it was very centered on Western European that's, uh, culture. When he was, you want me to get where you can see me? Yeah, come on up here. Well, I don't have to go up there. Please. Uh, you can, let's, we can, it's uh, not like we, we can sit here and, and go, right, you can I'll go there. And, okay, I'll here. stand, you sit. Okay, you, you sit. Let's just get a chair. What, you can see me? Here I am. One of the criticisms of, of but Maslow was not that way. Neither was Erickson, by the way. They did a lot of work in social. As a matter of fact, Maslow, when he was a young man, lived for a year, it was at least a year, with the Blackfeet Indians in Canada. And they still had a lot of their traditional culture, right? They re really weren't very westernized, obviously somewhat, but it was like at the beginning of the 20th century. So they, they uh, and he saw different culture, and he, he was a good anthropologist and sociologist, and he saw different expressions of needs coming out, right? And these kinds of things are, so it's very important to understand that. So for instance, even on our own society, in some places having a deer's head on your wall brings you great prestige. In other places, no, it's tying yourself to a deer so a hunter can't shoot it brings it prestige or whatever. I don't know. You're right? capturing the soul right. of a deer. In some places, in some cultures, a lot of money brings you prestige. Having the money just for having the money. You're rich. I mean, the richest people in our culture, they don't need any more money. What are, they, what are people who have billions of dollars going to do with more money? But there's prestige in making the money. Do. In other cultures, it's not. Okay? So, and, and sometimes it's ambivalent. For instance, the, years ago there was a, a survey, who were the, high, the highest prestige occupations? And judges and university professors finished first. I don't know if it's still true, but you can take my word for it. University professors are not a high income group. Okay? So... They did finish second on the jo uh, highest jobs, uh, high, like best job. This is recently job, right. Second, and, second so. right. And I'll never forget the time I, I met someone who ran a junkyard, right? And this guy had a lot of money, right? And I met him. And I was sitting down. He walked in, and I jumped up to shake his hand. He said, "Oh," he said, "Professors don't have to get up for junk men, right?" So even though he had much more money than I, the, clearly something in his his values said, "Oh, education is more prestigious than money," right? 
one of my friends in high school married uh, someone who also was in junk where I grew up in Rochester, and his basic attitude was, I pick up, I make more picking up junk in one day than you do in six months, right? So he, he had a different value system, right? So, but in each case, it was important for him to feel, you know, it was important to both, you know, to him to feel satisfied. So you have to be careful about this. So may as well tell you, culture will determine, may determine what satisfies the needs. For instance, even the basic needs, most of you would have to get pretty hungry before you'd eat a cockroach, cockroaches. Right? Look at the faces. Okay, but there are cultures where it's a delicacy. People, yeah, where people eat insects or even delicacies. Mm. Go to a store and see how much a chocolate covered ant costs, a box of chocolate covered ants. Just the thought of it makes me go, Brrr, but that's... They're quite okay. good. But there, he says they're good, I know. So... Tastes like Dr. Pepper. <laughs> yeah. I don't like the taste of Dr. Pepper either. But that's... Oh, I'm sorry. It's <gasps> fine, it's fine. What are you okay, doing? So these are the kinds of things <laughs> you have to ask yourself. These are the kinds of things you have to Dr. ask Dr. Pepper's yourself. great. <laughs> okay. He grew up in the South, I didn't. Okay, so these are the kinds of questions, but you have to remember that the needs are the same, and whenever you see a specific behavior, Maslow's going to say, you've got to ask, what need may it be, sat is it, uh, uh, do I think it's satisfying? All right. Just say. Wait, let me just, <laughs> Come here. wait, now you can go back. No, look, look, Kama, you're going to talk anyway. No, I'm not. Yes, you here. are. Watch. <laughs> I just want to. You're just going to you, sit. I want to get you, wait what? a minute, I just want to get you back. Ah, uh, come on. To where? Just stay here. Okay, now we, we're back to the hierarchy. Want to get us back to the hierarchy? Well, this is the part that I'm not as good at as you. So. Okay. okay. Take a seat. Sit. Sit. Parking they're gonna. They're gonna drive. You're gonna drive them crazy. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. So. Physiological needs. We really been, have been sitting basically on the physiological needs and kind of extolling that part of it. Let's go up the ladder a little bit up the hierarchy, and. Uh, there's, <laughs> there's going to be safety needs. Now, notice that there's, it's, it's physical safety as well as consistency and predictability. Can anyone have, does anyone have any idea why I put consistency and predictability? Physical safety, having a house, having, you know, having protection, being in a, in a country that protects its borders that people don't just walk through and, and, and uh, uh, rape, murder, pillage, burn. So we don't have to, what, what would be the, the next thing is the consistent predictability. That's a little bit more abstract. What, what, does anyone have an idea? Let's make some, what, well, first, well, over here. Make sure you press the button. Um, I guess like a stable home environment kind of thing. The parents are there all what the time. What way a stable home? And what, you say stable home, but that means a lot of different things. Okay. Um, like you can go to sleep and be reasonably sure that the people who were in the home when you went to sleep are going to be there in the morning. Just physically seeing that person and it's the same person every day. Yeah. Good. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's it, the consistency part, predictability. You had a, another? I was thinking like having a job and having the same routine day in and day out. So routine, yeah. So it sounds like you know, we're, we're creatures of predictability, that's to good. be honest. I mean, there's, there's an aspect there. So we feel, does anyone else have a, oh, I didn't see anybody's hand, he was, uh, we had experiencing technical difficulties again, so. Did you see anybody else have a hand over here? No. No brave souls this morning. Thank you, gentlemen, for contributing. Um, Put the camera back on him, can you? They're not, it's okay. Um, the, what happens is, is that the safety needs, <laughs> 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 the safety needs are actually very, very crucial well, again when you're talking about education. Stay in the picture. Go ahead. While you're talking, I'll get out. Oh, you're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> we can do this together. Go ahead. We will. Don't worry. I know. It's awful, isn't it? <laughs> All right. Consistency and predictability, okay? Um, see, the point's gone. Thanks. All right. Um, does everyone get that? Do you, do you understand what we're talking about with consistency and predictability? We'll talk about physical safety here. I, I have a thing for you. Here's another one. Um, how, why do you, this? Because this, this is interesting to me. Why do women like cell phones? Safety. <laughs> Safety. Why do women like? Do you know that there are more? The very first technological device that is used more by women than by men, it's, it's as of uh, 2004, 
There are more women in the world that have cell phones, that use them, that have accounts, than men. How many women here, your first cell phone was purchased for you by a parent or a friend or something so, by a, so that you would be safe? Yeah, it's the first cell phone I ever bought was so that my, I was, or I said, oh, good, my daughter's driving around. Now if something happens, she can, you know, it's, it was ev just about every woman, by the way, raised her hand. Now, here's another one. How many of you have ever utilized a cell phone to not talk to someone or as you're walking out to the car parking lot to show that you're talking to someone live? Has anyone done that? <laughs> See? <laughs> yeah, there, wait, no, put, no, no wait, so go ahead and tell, tell me your experience. Push, it, push the button. Push the button. <laughs> I usually get more in trouble by not having it on. Not having it on. You, why do you not have it? I mean, what, who do you get in trouble by? Parents, sisters, friends. They're like, why don't you have it on? Okay. And so, because you have to be connectable to them at all times. Yes. Or okay. why aren't you carrying it? <laughs> so, but is that a necessarily safety or is that a level of control? I think more mm -hmm. safety. <laughs> That's the thing. It has both means. It's a community, community, well, this, okay. But as far as, that's a, we're going to go get into an area that, that's, my candidacy proposal is this morning, so sorry about that. And it deals with social interactions and cell phones and things like that. And um, I, I was just interested because the physical safety, the number one reason why people say they get cell phones and say someone, oh, here, I'm giving you a cell phone so that I can communicate you and you can be safe at all the times. I'm giving you a cell phone so that I can call you at any point in time and make sure and check up on you and make sure that I know where you are at all times. Exactly. So it's interesting because that's a, if you, it, it's a, as far as deprivation and things goes, when you, when you're, okay, let's take the other. We're talking about when you have it. What happens when you don't have physical safety? Think about it. What happens when you feel, okay, physical safety. How many of you have experienced, this is an, you're, you're still, you're moving around and stuff. How many experience a sense of loss or a sense of loss when you're moving, when you're moving from one home to another? I'm trying to get something. We got one there. Another one? No, no. All right, you don't think of it this way. How many, <coughs> next time you're moving or you're around somebody that's moving, watch their behavior patterns change. The reason why is because they are losing the comfort and the safety net that has been their home, okay? No matter if it's an apartment, no matter whatever it is. And so people who are moving are extremely irritable because they're unsure about where they're moving to. If you've ever helped anyone move, you know this to be true, okay? They're generally off the wall bonkers. And, it's, and you can tie it back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, even, Dr. If the, Dr. even if it's the dream house that they always wanted? Even if it's the dream house that they always wanted, it doesn't make any difference because it's the fact that the need is, is there and there's uncertainty and there's no consistency, there's no predictability about this new place. And they're leaving the safety of their friends, their environment, and where they're at, and they're going to a new environment. Right. Now, exactly. that ties Not directly. Getting away your predictability. Right. And so it's the next in... in uh, what happens is she goes, she talks about friends, social network, things like that. You move right up. If you've got your physiological needs, you're not hungry, if you're not hurt, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't fear for your life, okay, with your physical safety, if everything, if your routine is normal, then, then we get into love. Love. But let me just give a couple of examples about safety if I could. Oh. It, almost. We almost one, got there. One, one. If you remember, there was a period, uh, some of you may be too young, several years ago, where there was tremendous, well, it wasn't that long ago, uh, uh, f f concerns about physical safety of the kids in the school, people bringing in oh, knives yeah. and people, this, people, and that. When they went, and so we have to hire extra police, and we have to put frisking machines, and all these kinds of things, that cost a fortune. You'll get battles about buying new textbooks, people scream and yell, let them use the old ones, what's the but about this, nobody said anything, because that was physical safety, kids, physical safety. So that's very, that's very, you have to remember that. That's basic. Okay, at least examples about that were better than mine. I want to, I want to say one other thing about predictability. <clears throat> Many years ago, when it still occurs in some place, I had a student in a graduate course who said, said, and it was the, uh, 
it was the, fall, the uh, spring semester. So about two-thirds of the way through the semester, getting near the end of the school year, she said, you know, she said, I had 22 kids in my class when I started the school year. She said, I still have 22 kids in my class. Two of them are the same kids. Kids in, kids out, moving around, etc. And that's, that, that's, uh, uh, it, it was very unnerving for her. She said, I never knew what I was going to find when I came into the classroom. I just, lo she said, I I'm lost. I don't know what to do. It's very unpredictable. But doesn't that come from within? Because at the same point, she can become predictable that she's not going to have the same students every time and then become comfortable with that and still move on beyond. Yeah, uh, maybe. That could be. But this was, this was brand new for her. This was brand new for her. And, and it was in a school district. I don't want to mention it, that it before had, been, had not had that kind of a, 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 you know, transient student population. So these things are important, and they're important for you, too. There is nothing worse than a teacher who one day, and I actually supervise a teacher like this, is having to the kids, oh, climb on the bookcases. I'm not exaggerating. Slop all over the desk. Roll on the floor. Do your work. And the next day, everybody quiet. Sit down. Go to seats. Hold your hands. Kids don't know what to expect. It's, very, it's not good to do that. So you need to have kind of predictability in class. How many of people have heard 50,000 times in your courses, be consistent, be consistent, be consistent? Who's heard that at least 15 times, right, all of you? Right? Mm -hmm. This is where it's from. This is where it's from. It's, and it's right. And uh, just, uh, I want to, because while I was, Dr. Lieberman was speaking, I've got a really good uh, illustration of this um, for, for all of it together. Uh, as we all know, uh, September 11, 2001 was a pretty life-changing or course-changing event. Um, I happened to be a, a new school teacher in the process of uh, like 12 days in on that day. So that experience was truly the fear, the, um, some of you might have been in school, some of you might have been teaching or a part of education, but being involved in education that day was uh, traumatic, to say the least, because when people, real, after they got over the shock of what was happening, the first thing that they wanted, the very first thing, was to come get their kids. And the kids, the kids weren't, they didn't quite, it didn't really hit them as much at that point. But the, their parents' fear turned into their fear, and it was, um, it was, it was everything we could do to, to keep everyone sane. And it is very important for that reason is that our consistency, you know, the, the World Trade Towers were there, and we'd never experienced anything on that scale. And we had been inured against that form of terrorism. And we got a wake-up call, and it changed. If you look, since that point, our whole focus, and we have become more aware and more attuned to that reality, which is one unfortunately suffered by most of the rest of the world. And because of that, our con you know, the consistency and predictability was shattered. And when it's shattered like that, you, you have a lot of people going back to those safety needs, back to the, you know, you'll, you'll see everything focused back there. And uh, that, that's, it was, it was truly, uh, it was a sad, very, very sad day. Um, I'm sure some of the people who are experiencing Columbine, unfortunately, Col Col they didn't find out about Columbine, Columbine until most of the school had let out, whereas 9-11 happened at 9 a.m. and you went through the entire day trying to explain why, you know, you know at the time we thought 50,000, 60,000 people were dead. And going through all that, trying to explain why somebody would do, that, why someone would do that, and the the, the <coughs> reasoning behind it was quite difficult. Um, that was my little, little <laughs> love, and what? love and belonging needs. Um, all right, uh, how many of you are married? Raise your hand. When you the, got the ones who aren't smiling, right? <laughs> don't, don't tell my wife I said that. When you got married, I'll, I'll just let you in on a little thing. My my mother will be here tomorrow, and me and my fiance live together in order to save enough money for the wedding. And the my my fiance is having a really big issue <laughs> because um, she's never she's not had a a mother per se. 
her mom was not around. And so it is a big, huge love and belonging issue because she doesn't quite feel that she's she belonged yet because she's not married and so she's dealing with her my mom will be in the house for four days so you can imagine what we spent I'm all cleaned up now the house is all cleaned up now there are issues that she wants everything to be perfect and she doesn't realize that my mom's from the country and it, don't, it doesn't make any difference as long as we allow her to cook she'll be happy to let them both watch this <laughs> oh yeah I talk to them about it all the time yeah, they'll, they'll be there forever and ever and ever. But whatever I tell, I, I have the same conversation. But it's, they both, and my mom is nervous too because she wants to make sure that, you know, that her future uh, daughter-in-law, and so they're both incredibly anxious and nervous, even though they don't have to be. But it's because that sense of belonging more than love. Love is a, love is a difficult one, and I'm going to let Dr. Lieberman talk about that. I, I, although, if... If a child is unloved, you can imagine what happens. If, if, if they detect or feel that they are definitely, no one loves them, is that going to be an issue? <laughs> is that going to make someone who is good not good? Yeah. Go ahead, you had a question? I've heard someplace or saw someplace where they did a study where children were hugged, children were hit, and children were ignored. And the children that were ignored had more of a problem than the ones that had violence towards them. It's interesting. Go ahead, and, go ahead, Dr. It's, it's, you know, to me, that it's not, it's not surprising that people, right, love and belongingness obviously starts from the family. You can hear Mesel's roots back in Freud, even though he's not a, a Freudian and rejects Freud's idea that everybody's evil and people, people, these people are basically good, you can, you can hear that. So that's one, that's one issue. But yeah, people need to feel that they belong to a family, they need to belong to a group, they need to belong to a club. Everyone, all psychological examiners have seen this. When we finish Kohlberg, you'll see how he talks about that. It's, uh, and people need to feel that they're part of something. And this can, and schools often don't do the world's best job of this, right? Some people belong, some people don't. It's one of the reasons that I have uh, all these problems about labeling kids. Well, there's something, you're not quite right. Kids who have, who have labels, often they will get a, 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 a high school diploma on it with a stamp. You know, a LD diploma or MR diploma or something like that. You know, I don't know if they still do that, but they did that for years. This idea that, you know, there's something wrong that you don't quite belong. There's less. Right. It's very, very difficult. Let me, right? And, and often you will see people turning, turning in, right, into in places where they do belong. And kids who don't belong have a feeling that they don't belong. It's often, let me give you another example of one that somebody told me. Some, a therapist came to me who worked with kids who are, uh, uh, they're homeless, they're, they're, they, they call them, they're having sexual identity issues, but most of them in high school are, are coming to realize that they're homosexual. So he said to me, anybody ever call you when you were in school a dirty Jew? I said, yeah bother you? I said, yeah. He said, but when you went home, your parents were Jews too, <laughs> right? If you get racial cracks, when you go home, your parents are part of that group. And there's a support group. We said, but when a kid gets called, gets called a lousy fag and he goes home, the odds are very high that his parents are not homosexuals. And he gets lost, right? He doesn't know where to go. He doesn't have a place to belong. And it's, th there was one point at which it was an estimate that one third of the kids who are, who are uh, self identified as homosexuals attempt suicide. That's an enormous health crisis that we have in our schools. So it's something, and that's why they have support groups and come along and be here. Interestingly enough, what was interesting is that he did a survey of counselors in schools, and this was in the valley, a lot of agricultural kinds of places. Almost every counselor said, I, they didn't say, oh, I don't want anything to do with these people. Rather, their attitude was, I want to help, but I don't know what to do. How do I include them, right? And in general, we often have this in our schools, the question of inclusiveness. And in your classroom, is there a place for everyone? And often the attitude of the school, this is what bothers me, is slap a label on and get the kid out of here. 
reckless today. She doesn't belong. He doesn't belong, right? And that bothers me. And I can see there's a lot of that. And, and, and to some extent, we often set up, you know, kinds of ways that we belong or we don't belong. If you remember with Kohlberg, we talked about, right, stage three, this need to belong when you're a jet, you're a jet all the way, right? Right? And if you don't have a place where, where kids belong, where you're not a jet all the way, it becomes a very difficult problem. This is the, the crushing of those psychological bones, so to speak. Let me just say one other thing. One of the reasons why periodically they propose year-round schools, not for any great education reason, because it, it's to use the facilities more, you don't get on crowding, but I'm opposed to it. And the reason is because there are places where people belong. Anybody here want to admit that the place you had the best belong was in the summer camp you went to? I know one person who said, I went to the YMCA summer camp, saved my life. Yeah, I mean, he just told me that flat out, okay? Anybody here, when you were a kid, you felt much more identified with a church group or the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts than you did with the gang at school, right? Me too, right? I am, me, right? And it makes a difference. It makes a difference to your whole secular life. As long as we're talking about personal examples, my brother had a gang at school he really got along with. I really didn't, but I got along very well in religious school, okay? To this day, as many of you have known, I'm very religiously and ethnically attached, right? He's not that much. He's not, right? And I just have a feeling it goes back to this deep, he found his belonging to someplace else, one place, and I found it another. I just liked the people, but I got along better, right? And my mother, by the way, was a Hebrew teacher. It wasn't like, you know, it was an accident. I mean, it was, all, it was up there for him. But he, you know, he just, he found his belonging to someplace else. So it's, it's important. And in a classroom, you need to have a place for every kid, every kid's talents. That's why it bothers me. Those of you who are the art teachers, that's why I keep berating you, right? You know, it's important. Because kids who are great at art and don't read too well, they don't belong. Oh, you have dyslexia, right? Kids who read well and not go to art don't have dysdrosia, right? Because... Somehow, we, our value system says certain people belong in the top and certain people don't. Certain skills. Certain skills, right. Certain skills don't. And, and you, uh, maybe we can talk about that more. He's involved in talent development. And, you, and if you have a chance to make a kid that feel that she or he belongs someplace, you, you, you need to do that. You I've got a understand. good example of that. Go ahead. Um, what happened is in my school uh, that where I taught, uh, we had a, a new student that was transferred in from another uh, high school in the, uh, in the Houston area. Um, in that high school, he was first chair violinist. In our high school, we had band. No orchestra, no, <laughs> nothing available to, along those lines. In addition, this child was also uh, labeled ADHD. And so when he came, they, made, they, they changed his dose when he first got there. And the kid was a um, space astronaut. That's what it, he, he basically, a little cosmonaut, just sat there and was zonked out of his mind on drugs. Just say no to drugs and pump yourself full of Ritalin or whatever. They well, it was, it was weird. Ahead. He had something that was like ultra focus, that he would focus too hard on something and forget everything else in the world. So he had to limit it. So in the drugs that he had to take, made him to where he was just kind of catatonic. And as he got it used to, and so at first I was like, oh my God, this kid's just spacey. I didn't know anything about it. One day, he brought to class uh, a, a, a little uh, can of, this has been like six, seven, maybe 10 weeks into the first semester. And he brought in his uh, the suitcase for the violin, and he brought it with him because he was going to somewhere, you know, some kids bring skateboards and they have to put them up. Well, he brought his violin. And that's, that's kind, of a, it was kind of a rare thing in, that, in the school that I was working in. So I asked him about it, and he said, yeah, I play. And I was like, well, it, it was, I was teaching theater, so I was like, hey, why don't, why don't you play for us? He took it out. <laughs> this kid wasn't just a little good. He, uh, if you've ever known the red violin, uh, he, he whipped off all of the, the, the main course, you know, all the, you know, the real fast part. Just popped it in, did it on his own. Um, and just the entire class was stunned because up until this point, 
this this kid had not was not part of the class. He wasn't very good at theater. He didn't move around at all. As soon as he picked up that fiddle and, and that uh, that bow, or that fiddle, uh, sorry, from the country, the violin and the bow, and um, uh, he he it was awesome. And so what happened is, is there was nothing, and he started you know because there was nothing for him. This was his passion. He began to not really care about school, get in trouble, truant, you know, because it wasn't there. And it's obvious because of this thing. And they actually took up his, his violin that day because he shouldn't have had it with him. And that to add, compound things. And this is kind of what put me on that path is that he got in trouble for bringing this instrument, which he could no longer do, which it was, it was really, you know, it was this, it, there was this policy, school policy. He wasn't allowed to have it. You know, there's these things because it was a big case. And this is safety issues, safety needs. And so that's why it got searched and looked at. And who knows? He might have been pulling a fast one. You never know. The deal is, is that um, after that, I, ha I, I arranged for him to play between uh, sessions. Between when we went from class class to class at lunchtime, he would have a little set and he would play, and the kids would just gather around him. And then he got in trouble for that because he was keeping kids from getting to their classes on time. So we had to figure out a different way. The the and I work. I kept working with the assistant principals and it ended up he ended up every after a while they knew that this talent was there and he was willing to do all these things he lived right next to the school he could walk and, and so he was available for all these things so he guess what he started MC started being providing live music to all of the banquet shows that were there he started providing all the things he started getting gigs at weddings and so that's how you when you have someone in your class where you have to do that where there's a talent thing you have to take it upon yourself because you know, he would have gotten in trouble three different times for those things. Yet, he now has a place in that school. And it, it, was, it was an awesome experience. And that, that taught me that if you, you can't, it doesn't hurt to try. I mean, and, I, and you know, I'm, I'm big into talent development. I think we, we, do a, we do a disservice to a lot of children because we do not focus on what they're good at. We focus on what they're bad at. Anyway. Very good. Let me, what Lee said, um, is the crucial thing is a place for every child and focusing on what children can do okay. that's that's the crucial aspect here and you'll notice okay there are two things first of all it's not so easy the truth is he just dumb lucked into knowing that the kid had a violin because he brought it in but when he saw it he jumped on the opportunity okay play it let's see if you're any good okay Probably would have told him it was pretty good even if it hadn't been that good. You're right. right. But this okay, kid that's was. Good, you're the only one who plays the violin. Exactly. And second, when you see it, right, you have to you, you have to have a place for it. I remember my wife put together a journal once for the kids, and there was one kid, he just couldn't write, and it was a literary journal. He used to win prizes, all this kind of stuff. One day she's doing all this stuff on the typewriter and Xeroxing things off center, and he said, you know, I can do that on my computer and do it quickly. This was a long time ago, obviously, right? And he became, and stuff that took her hours, he did in two minutes, right? He was just a computer guy and couldn't write very well, but he could type the stuff up and get it and center it and all that. And once she saw that, it's hard. You have to dig for what kids can do. And you have to say every talent is important. Everything that people can do is important. And it, it can be, but what he said, there has to be a place for everyone. There's a place for us somewhere. That's it, <laughs> right? There's and, an, yeah. and by the way, this is one of the things that bothers me about multiculturalism. <laughs> what, if you're, what if you're weird, right? And you're, right? If you notice Tiger Wood, who who's, has one Asian parent and one black parent, right? You can see he struggles with that. Where do I belong? I don't tick off the things. He's the one who wanted to tick off other or multiracial or something. These things make a difference to people. They need to feel they belong. Of course, the best way to avoid that one is to say, we're all people and get rid of that stuff. Or do it on your own, it's your business. But the, the key is you need to have in your classroom a place for people and, look, and looking for kids' talents and telling them this is good and, and, and finding a way that they can express it. Okay, there's, al there's also an, a very important aspect to this when you're utilizing doing these things. It took my administration a little while to realize what I was doing, but once they realized what they had, they went all out to 
to utilize that talent and provide a place. You just have, it's, it's very difficult uh, when you're in that, because you're all going to be teachers or you're heading that way, you're going to be teacher-esque uh, in some way or shape or form, you're going to be part of the education system or hoping to be. And it's very difficult because you can, your spirit w can get, draw, you, as, a, as a teacher, trying to do these things and going through these things, it is very difficult to continue to do it if you know that your administration is not going to support you on it. Because you might be, they might look at it as if you're doing, if you're looking at some you know, individual, they, what do they, they can't focus on one kid. It's just they don't have the time, the resource, or the, or the money to do so. So what happens is, is that it comes to you. The, all that stuff was extra stuff that I did on my own. That I didn't get paid for, meeting with the principals, doing, setting up all the extra stuff. It wasn't part, that's not, if you think about it, that's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to teach or to, to make sure that they have the skills, okay? I didn't see it that way. And I don't, and I think Maslow wouldn't, I mean, I just really, if there's something I can impart to you about that, there's, I'm telling that story now because of what I did, because it meant so much to me. Those little things, doing those little things to help those individual students sometimes merit, allow you to survive when, when in those systems. And it's a survival thing. I, I'm not going to sugarcoat you. It is very difficult to say four out of five of you, if you're all going to become teachers, in five years will no longer be in the profession. That's, that's not a, a made-up figure. That's not a, so it's four out of five. And so a lot of times, finding those one students or finding those students and, and working with all of your students in a one-on-one in -on -one individual basis. I know it takes forever and it's hard and it's, it's, it's idealistic, but I'd certainly rather be that than to be pessimistic. And you know the Jets? When you're a Jet, you're a Jet all the way. Why? You could see. Nobody liked them. The cops hated them. They obviously didn't do well in school, so there's where you belong. If you don't belong, get a sense of belongingness in a healthy environment, or what we consider a healthy environment, is an unhealthy environment. Exactly what Colbert talked about in his stage three. Before we go to the next stage, I'm going to give a little quiz. There's a one-word definition for love and belongingness in the university. What is it? Family. Push it down. So for faculty at the university. Oh. Tenure. You have tenure, you belong. We're keeping you around. So, and it's important to people, so. Can we talk about the steam needs in that? Yeah, let's go to, on to steam needs now. Go ahead. Oh, you want me to talk yeah, about you, steam well, needs? Yeah, you had a okay. great uh, steam right. needs about the tenure I'll stuff. I'll move it to the center. Because yeah, about, you know, okay. your stories about whenever you get right. the. Esteem, yeah, okay, it's. You're direct, when you became the head. You understand what's happening. Here you say, if I only had something to eat, I'd be happy. Then you get enough food, and you say, oh, if I only were saving, then I'd be happy. And you're safe and things like that. Say, oh, now, if only people would love me, I'd belong, I'd be happy. If they just accept me in that group, I'll be happy. Then they accept you in the group. And you say, oh, now I want to be the president, right? Now I have to have somebody saying something to me. Belongingness and esteem, I don't think our schools do well. Esteem is very interesting. Usually we give esteem to the same people over and over, okay? I'll tell you this. Once I was in a school, I taught one course just to, for many years, just to remind myself, I taught one course from uh, 8 to 8.30 in a, in a Jewish parochial school. Um, it was a, they called it prayer and discussion, but I had stuff with the kids. And the principal would die to have me come to the teachers' meetings. Of course, most of the time I couldn't make it, especially if somebody from the board was going to be there because it's, oh, Dr. Lieber. So I used to try to go. So one day I go, and he, he says, okay, we're going to have now a student service corps, whatever it is, you know, office helper. For some reason, middle school kids think that being the office slave is big honor, right? <laughs> big service corps. So he said, well, it's, go it's going to be, that's what he called <laughs> it, right? <laughs> Special. I don't know. They, these kids did anyway. So, oh, you're slave. chosen for the service corps. You're going to help in the office. You're going to be the assistant secretary, whatever they told them. Kids mm -hmm. wanted to do it. So he said, attendance. the kids have to have good attendance, right? Excellent conduct grades. Be recommended by a teacher because a person cooperative can work with others and have a B plus average. So I said to my husband, I said, Phil, what are you doing? If you have a kid who's trying hard, who's here all the time, who, who really has good conduct, who the teacher thinks is good, 
and has a B minus average. Or even the kid is struggling as a C average. So you're going to say, no, we're going to keep rewarding the same people over and over again? This guy was a good principal. He said, you're right. Take that B plus average out. Okay? Find a way to give someone else esteem. Okay? I still remember when I was in fifth grade, the teacher had a job for everyone in the class. And they were all very important. I remember mine for a long time was to feed the fish. I have to go ding ding with the fish. <laughs> right? But she made it. She created the image that it was. It may have been a very functional thing, right? But she created that image that, or that that self-esteem right. uh, uh, level because of how she interacted. That's with right. it. very important. You're the one. If you don't feed them, the fish will die. There were other <laughs> there were other tasks that were more important, right? To those of us like opening and closing the windows. I could never get them straight. Never could get them lined up. So I only did that for one day, and she said, oh, I have a better job for you. Right? Much more necessary and she job. Took, she, remember I told you Arthur, the great athlete? Arthur, that was Arthur's job when we were in fifth grade, getting the windows right. He was just well coordinated. Okay? So these, okay, it's important to find a place for everyone and think of prestige to everyone. Okay? And that kid became the copy editor. And the kid who couldn't write and could draw uh, did the front page and became... The, uh, the, uh, the art editor, okay? And then the kid who, the outside cover of the art editor. And there was one kid who could draw okay, but not to a good write. That kid did little sketches inside of the journal, my wife's journal. That became the inside co co copy editor, whatever. Find ways for kids to get esteem, for kids to do well. It's one of the reasons that the no, no, no pass, no play rule bothered me. Because often those are kids who are getting prestige someplace else. Right. They can do something well on the sports field. So what... You know, so why do you bother? Why, why, you know, find a way so that they can still study and still keep doing this? I got a story. Go ahead. Uh, At least a good athlete, by the way. Yeah. What Unlike happened? Me. Okay, my, uh, in my, uh, I, I was a baseball player for like 10 years. And uh, I know I don't look like it now, but I was, <laughs> I was pretty good. And um, the no class, no play rule came out when I was in school in the seventh grade. I know that dates me a little bit, but here in Texas. And um, we went, uh, uh, just to give you an idea, in seventh grade, that's when it came out, the, our, we had six teams playing each other in seventh grade football. Very big, uh, you know, if you go, if you, you want to see all the people in town, go to Friday night football games in East Texas and you'll find everybody in town. That is a truism that is still today. <laughs> so uh, there may be 2,000 people in the town, but they'll probably have a stadium that seats 6,000. That is another truism. Um, what happens is, is that uh, I was playing football at that time before I got into baseball, but this is one of the reasons why I didn't play football. We started off with 33 players on each team of seven teams. We filled seven teams. So basically every single boy that, you know, <laughs> that was playing in, in, our, in our school district was playing football. No pass, no play came, rule came out. Three weeks in the season, we were three and zero, and we're like the best team in the league. Okay. We went from thirty-three players, and I and I was like the starting left tackle or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, you know, it's hundred and thirty pounds playing offensive line, which is just funny. But um, they changed. We lost. Uh, we went down to seventeen players, from thirty-three players to seventeen players. I went from left tackle to playing defensive right defensive back, and and I was the halfback. So I went from Offensive line to those two things. We went 0-3, and, and I got hurt and injured. And, and What happened is, is that all the players got, because they didn't have grades, because it was a new thing, and they all didn't go. And a lot of kids didn't ever come back to playing football, and doing all, they didn't make the grades. They never, never were going to make it. Unless you were very talented or special, then the grades magically came to you. Another thing is, is that when I got into ninth grade, this wasn't a big issue, and I was in all the honors classes and did all the different things. I was a very successful student, and um, more because I wanted to get out, not because of any need to do well. It was more I wanted to be in college. But I was taking algebra, at that time I was taking algebra two in the ninth grade, which was a much higher level class than what you normally take in there, in that, at that level, at least in that school. Well, for the third six weeks, and if you know anything about baseball, the fourth six weeks is when you begin to you know, try out and do those things. Well, for the third six weeks, um, I got sick and 
I had to take a test back after Christmas holidays, and I got a 36 on the test, and because I got a 36 on the test, I ended up with a 66 for the class for that six weeks. Now, this is the first time I'd ever made below a C. And I went from B, I had all, I'll never forget on the report card, I had six A's and an F. So it was pretty dramatic and traumatic because guess what? Because I was in it, because when you fail the third six weeks, that means guess what? Fourth six weeks, you can't, you can't try out. So here I was like probably the 15th student or 16th student in the class and rankings out of around 400. And I had failed, because I had failed algebra two, which was way farther in advance of what I was, um, or what I, what I had, it was far, you know, it was the honors course, algebra two honors. But because I had failed the honors course, that made me ineligible for that baseball season. Okay. And uh, so I couldn't play in the ninth grade. And then in the 10th grade, I, you know, I made varsity or uh, JV. And it was very, very important to me at that point in time. And I, 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 I'll, that, I, can, I can pinpoint when I, this, I began, I, I was kind of tentatively not liking school. But that's when I really began not liking school. Because that affected me, that's my self-esteem as far as being a baseball player because I had you know, gotten all these trophies and things like that for being a really good baseball player. And now I was not allowed to do it with all the other people on the team. And I understand the reasoning behind the rule, but it's, it goes to, if you're only good, if this is the only thing that you're good at, it's not a question about trying to make everyone, they're try, everyone you're trying to make everyone equal. You're saying if you don't do this, then you can't do this. But you know, some people on the, on the football field or the baseball field, no one else can do what they can do. And so it's, uh, it's, it's saying that, okay, we don't val we're validating this all the time, okay? But the talent, we're, we're penalizing talent. And uh, in a way, that's what, I mean, I'm not saying that it, it, mine was a unique case, but I, I definitely got the experience that was a little, and, and Dr. Lieberman can comment on it, because I, when I start talking about those past experiences, I start thinking about them. Right. <laughs> it's, you, you'll notice, Lose by focus. the way, that Maslow, is agreeing with Freud. Look at how all, both of us are bringing up experiences from long times ago. These things have a permanent effect on your personality in many ways. And there's one other thing I remember to the positive side. I went to, a, when I was a little kid, um, we lived a walking distance from the YMCA. So my mother used to cross me over the street, it was just one cross, and then I'd walk up to the YMCA. And I went to their day camp in the summer, right? And at the end of the year, we had the picnic in the park. You know, we they drive us to the park. My well, parents came, and every kid got an award. I still remember I was seven years old. What was that? Twenty years ago? Seven years old, and I still <coughs> yeah, six or seven, and I still remember the award. I got. What award do you give to the kid with the biggest mouth? Most enthusiastic <laughs> camper. Right? Most convivial. <laughs> right, something. No. Give him a big word. You have to, right, you have to find a place for every kid. And their kids will be pains in the neck. Okay? Kids. Right, I told you I'm teaching in a Sunday school, you know, that I uh, do that. I can tell her. There's Selfish. one kid, he's just, he's, he's just a something, right? But I like the kid, and he's bright. So I said, you know what? We're going to have a little service. You lead it. You do it. He, I mean, he's unbelievable. Sit in the class, make noise, scream, yell, won't listen to the teachers. But he's smart. So I, and once he's doing it, he can't interrupt. He's interrupting himself, right? You've got to find a way to make people belong and to feel that what they do is important. Esteem. It's very important. And schools are not to, we take the select few and you're an honors club, and you're in this, and you're in that, and you have to have a beer, and we give them high prestige. You understand that when you have a contest and one person wins, everyone else loses. Yeah. That's the problem, right? Interesting enough, in this Sunday school I'm teaching, the rabbi, <clears throat> he gets a piece of mail, right? And I see he takes it, and he crumbles it up and throws it out. But I could see there was passion in it. I was meeting with him about something. So I said, what is it? I take it, I fish it out of the garbage. It's end of the year certificates for outstanding achievement. And he said, I don't like that stuff. What, 
God likes you better than the person. This is a sinner, right? Oh, God likes you a little more. You've achieved more than being with God. What are you talking about? He said, what are you, nuts? He said, they've all achieved what they can. We're all trying to get them in, into line here. We're all trying to show the value and the worth of every human being, right? That's, that's important, okay? Once I heard, it, I, I do this lecture all the time. It was, I think it was from my Presbyterian clergyman. I remember I told you. Well, he said, he said, you have to remember you're the best thing that God ever made, but so is everybody else, right? And that has to be an attitude that you go in with. And what our schools do is they decide the people who behave like this, they are acceptable, the rest are not. We give them labels and pump them full of drugs. The people who are good at this, they're acceptable, they're good. The kid who's a great violinist, well, it's all right, but you know, you have to have a teacher who's pushing to bend the rules so they say, let this talent come out. And, and I know it's difficult to hear. Here's a kid who's, you know, they probably figured, what does he care? What does Lee care? He's an honor student. So if he doesn't play baseball for a year, who cares? That's exactly what happened. Right? Am I right? You can, you can see it. I've hung around schools for a long time. What's the difference? Baseball's not that important. He, he's got to sit in the other because he's going to be a great honor student. And they were right at one level. Look, he's getting his doctorate now. But on the other level, you can hear the emotional trauma it had on him. That's the time I began to hate school. That's the time I did it. And interesting enough, I told you, I don't know if I told you, there are two kinds of people who get into education. Those who had a wonderful experience and want to replicate it, and those who had some kind of traumatic experience and want to undo it. And it's not an accident that he's doing what he's doing. I want all talents to be done. I mean, you can see it. Well, the, the thing also is that, uh I had great experiences too. That's the. Of course. That's the. And of we course. talked about it last time with my my history teacher. Um, I don't know if y'all remember that one, but that that was also. So I had balance, but I always had it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. It was always the teachers that really went to the extra link that would motivate me, and I did more for them than I did for you know any of the other stuff. And then I began to question. That what happened is I, I ended up becoming a very difficult student to have in class because I would read. You know, we'd go into the class and I'd read the entire textbook in a few days and. You know, when they followed along, I'd know all the stuff. And so I became a very, very difficult student to deal with because, you know, I, I knew I could do, do everything. I could anticipate what the teacher was going, and I'd ask questions that I knew they couldn't answer because it wasn't there in the textbook. And so uh, trying to, it was really bad. I was trying to humiliate the, the teachers, and I was trying to humiliate the staff, and I was trying to humiliate any of the assistant principals because it, it veered me off because they kept me from doing. I didn't think of it now. I didn't do it consciously, <laughs> a little Freudian, <laughs> I didn't do it consciously, but I did it nonetheless. And so I, you know, but that, that was, you know, that was when it happened, right, right, right then, so. Let, let me, let me just say some things here now before we. We got it, because we, we have yeah, to do no, self actualization no, no, no. We'll, 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 get, I, I want to say something here now, and we'll probably do, um, we're going to spend the next two times doing the top levels of Maslow and Kohlberg, okay? the self-actualizing and what Colbert calls the post-conventional. What you have here from the point of view of psychology from Erickson and Maslow is a rejection of the idea that kids are basically rotten and need to be controlled. Okay? Rather there's a sense of mental health. That, kid, that you have to have a sense of mental health. And there's a sense that you need don't close it out yet. I'm not. I'm going back okay. to where it says. And there's a sense health. that you need that the purpose of all the social. Yeah, here you go. Go back to the. Go back to the PowerPoint if you can for a second. There's what Carol Tribe said. Okay. This is the purpose of education. Health. That's mental health, right? Growth. The actualization of human potential. Okay. Come back to me. Okay. The wellness. The whole wellness movement. You know that? The wellness movement comes from, from humanism. The thing that separates clinical psycho uh, counseling psychology, which comes off of this, or it used to anyway, from clinical psychology and Freud, was that clinical psychology and Freud were based on a medical model that said being healthy is not being sick. It's curing sickness, right? And that's what you had in the medical profession, too. And then along came some doctors, and along came Maslow, and the other humanists, 
and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not just, health is something by itself. It's not just an absence of sickness, okay? It's, it's health, it's growth. It's actually the potential of who you are. By the way, I gotta say one other thing. For some reason, for some reason, people have taken, there was a group called the Secular Humanists who said, oh, we believe in the human being, we don't need God. To my mind, that's a distortion of humanism, but it, at the very least, it's only one kind of humanism. Carl Rogers was a son of a minister, okay? I don't know how religious he was, but he certainly had an appreciation for religion. There was a group called Christian Humanists. This is not an anti-God theory. And it became, you know, a nice struggle, right? The, 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 okay, so let me just say that right now. Quite the opposite, as a matter of fact, in, in, my, in my opinion, okay? And this theory in particular is going to tell you, okay, Everybody is unique. Everybody is weird, okay? Everybody's unique in some way. Not unique out of sickness, the way Freud says, but out of health. How many people here collect something? <laughs> Who collects something? I already stole he your did thing. did collect something? Yeah. Okay, good. He did that already. So if you... They had some, weird, they had some good ones. They had some good ones. Right. The Sorry, things I you like, it. the things you appreciate, the things you do, you have to feel good about it. Look, I personally would rather go to a Broadway musical than a symphony. I'm telling you that right now. You can tell from the jet songs and all that. I used to feel guilty about it. Well, you're a university professor, you should. Right? Right? right. But what can I do? My son is a musician. He says, okay, they're both okay. But he doesn't have to. Okay? But these are, it's important to realize that kids' taste, they're unique, their desires, that's what counts. And in the end, that's what creates a productive human being who will contribute to society, not memorizing another 10 answers on the tacky test. Not drilling something that's, that's boring, that's, you call it, that's extrinsic to the child, right? That he or she will forget anyway. None of you can pass Algebra 2 anymore. You know it, unless you're going to be a math teacher, okay? Mostly would flunk any biology, this last, the science exams in high school, you'd fail them all unless you're taking science now, right? Yeah, what? But a sense of appreciation of the world, appreciation of science perhaps, a sense of who I am is valuable, that what I do is important, right? And it's tough. Look, I'm telling you right now, Lee's a very smart guy, right? And his teacher spotted it. And they were saying to themselves, it's more important for him to pass Algebra 2 and to go on to accomplish great things, right, than to play baseball. That rule's okay with him. And the truth is, at one level, they were right. He did go on. He's getting his doctorate now, right? Did great things, right? He's done some, got some, involved in some wonderful projects, right? He's, he's all a people he's one of the most desired graduate students around right even on the national level wow, wow. right what, what, what he's another, a good guy right what did I on the other, don't worry on the other hand <laughs> well, how much <laughs> i gotta pay you that's <laughs> it <laughs> right? he doesn't pay me any money oh, nice. on the other hand it's nobody's business to tell him look the baseball that's so important to you that's forget about it it was important. And I told you, that's how we met over baseball. Think taking my class. was one of the guys out there. The huge class. But then I 70. mentioned... 70. 70 people. And I mentioned baseball. He came up to me. Oh, baseball, right? <laughs> and we... And we... Well, we argued uh, yeah. quite a few points previous right. to that moment, I, but yes. I was right. <laughs> I don't know about the points, but about the baseball. We began to talk about baseball and playing baseball. It was important. Okay? I like baseball, too. So... I used to like it a lot. Yeah. So the so did I. Yeah. So the the key is, the key here is to you have to be responsive to who children are and who adolescents are, and what they want and what they need and what's going on. And in the end, what the humanists and and the neo Freudians and the Freudians and all the other other people we could discuss the existential causes are telling you, is that the purpose of education has to be mental health. That's what Summer, I mentioned Summerhill with Freud, right? That's what he's telling you. Look, what goes on in the classrooms 
is probably less important than creating a healthy individual. Well, it's obvious that the teachers were doing that too, otherwise they wouldn't have been working for him. Okay? That's the important thing. Kids' needs, getting them to have a sense of who they are, what they are, a sense of belonging, a sense of esteem, a sense of, and that means appreciating what you do. Okay? I appreciate what they, you're appreciating what they do as a teacher. And by the way, that goes on in other places too. People work in schools as teachers where they, they feel they're not appreciated. Okay? I've been an administrator off and on. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> and that was the most important thing I realized. You've got to give the teachers a sense that they're appreciated. Okay? And often there's a, this kind of a thing, right? Where you know the kids appreciate you and the administration doesn't. My wife's been in situations like that, right? And, she, you know, it sort of tears you. You need to feel that something good is going on, right? And the things are. And what do you do if you're a teacher and there's a poetry contest? You should let the kids enter the poetry contest. Well, that's happens to my wife all the time. She puts in enters, and she often has kids who win. She's a great English teacher, right? Okay, she often has kids who win. She just had this, unless we're talking about a kid who won a national silver key, won a gold key in use, won a gold key in the state, won a national silver key, right? Which is like, that's a big honor, right? Well, some of the kids didn't. Then you have to give them a sense that, okay, you didn't win, but it's, it's okay. You belong. You tried. You're special. You apply. It's, these are things that are difficult. I and mean, there are kids who will be crushed, who will be crushed by, who will be crushed by, let me get over here. Let me see if I can find this. Where are you okay? By not doing well. Because Maslow talks about what happens when needs are deprived. Let me see if I can find it here. Here we go. One of the most interesting things about Maslow's theory is, yeah, let's go back to the PowerPoint, okay. The less a need is deprived when it first emerges, the better a person is able to tolerate a subsequent deprivation of that need, okay. Therefore, if you want people to be able to tolerate food deprivation, be certain that they're never hungry. People go on hunger strikes were not deprived of food when they were children. You can take my word for it. Okay? If you want people to be able to tolerate danger, we're certain they feel safe. Already, I told them that. Story. Okay? Etc. So, did you do this slide already? <laughs> no. Well, I, I talked about your, okay. uh, you're going to launch into that story about, about the, the soldiers. soldiers yeah. Right. So, following this logic, if you want people to be able to tolerate frustration, don't frustrate them. If you want people to be able to tolerate failure, be certain that they succeed often. My wife has the kids who enter into this contest, the kids who know they're good poets. They've succeeded plenty. If you want people to tolerate humiliation, be certain you are constantly supportive and caring toward them. Okay? So come back to me for a second. So what this tells us, what this tells us is that, uh, uh, let me give you an example. They took people, they took 50 people, they took hundreds and hundreds of people who, and they gave them mental puzzles to do. And then they took, I think it was 50 people who had solved all of them. They were hard puzzles and they solved all of them. They divide them randomly into two groups. And the 25 on this side, they give a puzzle, another puzzle that they could solve. And the 25 on this side, they gave a puzzle you couldn't solve. It looked like you could, but you couldn't. And they did it again and again until these people had had six more successful experiences solving puzzles. And these people, these 25, had failed six times, okay? Then they gave all of them a seventh puzzle that couldn't be solved. Who do you think lasted, tried harder? The ones who had had six successes, or the ones who had six previous failures? I mean, you all know the ones who had had the successes. If you want people to tolerate frustration, and often the difference between a challenge and a frustration, matter of fact, the difference is my evaluation. Oh, I can't do that stuff, right. or That's... let me give it a shot. Go ahead, Lee. And that's where you have the control. That's where you can control. That sliding scale of evaluation is the thing that you can control. And by that, by what you do, how you evaluate, and the structures that you evaluate is, is difficult. Sometimes it's a very finite thing with numbers and things like that. And that's how numbers and letters is how we typically evaluate people. And, and so the thing is, is that it's, a, yeah, we got less time. 
But the, the thing is, is that I, I, I want to impart to you to make sure that you, th this theory, humanism is very, very difficult to do in schools. It takes a lot of time, a lot of commitment, and a lot of, uh, of extra effort on your part. But the rewards are, are, are to, to go above and beyond are that you probably will stay and become involved and stay with teaching. You, you can hear, when you feel that you've made a real contribution to children, you've taken a kid who's and said, you're important, and the kid gets this feeling, you belong, I appreciate what you're doing, not only is it wonderful for the kid, but it's wonderful for you. Take my word for it. He, he's been teaching much more recently than I have, so his examples are more current, but I, I've had, had the same feeling when I was teaching. It's important. Okay, next time we're going to finish, I'll finish Maslow, unless he wants to come and do it. I'll finish Maslow. <laughs> I have too and much then to do. we'll use the last one, I'll finish Kohlberg, and then we'll, we'll all be happy, and the semester will be over, and I'll go on vacation. Okay, see you next time.